Even if we do enjoy thinking ourselves as being in full control of our lives, sometimes we do need luck as well as a little bit of a driving force. But with more ancient societies, luck would have had a much deeper significance. How important was luck for the Norse kings? So for ancient Germanic world views. Let's have a look at a couple of literary sources and see what we can retrieve in terms of cultural history. So in Old Norse, you can find multiple terms designating luck. If you want to make a list, you're going to find at least four. One of them is Geva or Gipta. This meant something offered by a higher power sent forward to assist others. These could have been the Norns, so the entities in charge of destiny, or the Vedda, the Edskuld, or perhaps some other deities. Then we have the more general term of Hail, meaning omen and then we have hap meaning a lucky action perhaps however the difference in comparison to the first two terms is not really that clear and then the fourth term perhaps the most important one is that of hamingia this could be synonymous with another term which is the filgia they are both terms used in relationship with um, the soul in the sense that in the Viking Age, most likely the soul was not conceived as being this one entity, but being formed out of multiple parts. I actually made a separate uh, video for that, so feel free to um, check it out as well, where I explain the uh, functions of the different manifestations of the soul. So yeah, Hamingya. Uh, if you use it synonymous with the Filgia, it has a reference to some kind of supernatural uh, manifestation, even a supernatural creature as part of a soul and often in connection to a man's luck. Now, the motif of the Hamingya, deserting someone or not transferring to a particular person, is quite prevalent in the Old Norse uh, sagas because this concept tends to have been perceived as belonging to a particular uh, family, which is why it could have been inherited. Now, if you use it synonymously with the Filkia here, you can have two kinds of manifestations, one being the animal as an expression of someone's personality, but this animal doesn't really act independently. It is linked to this idea of shape-shifting, which might have been much older than retrieved in Old Norse literature. Um, however, we need to pay attention here because literature tended to um, transform these more ancient motifs in literary ones so the border between actual religious significances and literary motifs tends to be a little blurry and the second appearance could have been that of a woman this is also something you often find in the sagas some kind of guardian goddess uh, appearing and surviving the death of its um, of its owner this could have been the dis in plural the disir which are um, rather vague female deities but also some other female deities such as the nornir or valkyrie perhaps a dead ancestress the um, borders between these creatures were not really that clearly defined. At any rate, what we can notice here is a link between all these elements, but originally, most probably, we would have had a more palpable, uh, corporeal sense of this uh, personality aspect, because hammer actually means skin, so the physical expression of someone's personality. So, in other words, we do tend to have these overlapping, this convergence of multiple ideas, which are the gift from a higher power, the guardian spirit, the aspect of someone's personality. If you look at a couple of nicknames, this is going to become obvious. We have Leif Eriksson, who is also called Leifer in Hepni, so Leif the Lucky, the one traveling to uh, Vinland and um, managing to establish a colony there. And then you also have this idea of a trait of a faculty running in the family, thus also transferable. 
Odin seems to have been in charge of this aspect as well, especially because Odin was a god of the aristocracy, he was an elite god, and you can find some of his attributes expressed in the later source in the Ynglinga saga, the first saga about the legendary kings of uh, Norway, the first saga in the Heimskringla, written by Snorri Sturluson. So in chapter 7, for example, you can find the following information. Odin kuni tho ithrot er mestur motur filgri, og fram di sjolver er seyðir heitir. En að því moti hann vita örlok manna og uorna hluti, svo kat gera mönnum banam eða uhamingju eða vanheilindi. So the, the last part interests us. In the first part, it is stated that he had knowledge of this very special skill known as Seder, the magic, so the magical ritual, the practice. And um, through this, he could know the fates of people and untold things. And he could also cause death, bana, or misfortune, uhamingyu, or sickness in men. Van Helindi. This is very important. So there seems to be this idea of luck being given in a certain amount and linked to your sense of belonging to your family. However, this doesn't mean that luck was not changeable. It could have been influenced, for example, by the influence of a Saith Kona, a ritual specialist, a woman. And the Saith Kona could remove luck, could send Gandhir, the spirits, to drive someone insane or to use magic to affect luck in battle. For example, you have the uh, Seyth Kona Heider who brings good luck to King Frodi, who is looking for the sons of Halfdan in um, Hrolf Saga Kraka, but uh, then she changes her mind a little bit and um, eventually she makes a prophecy that he, the King Frodi, would be uh, killed by these two sons. There was also the example of Grettir, Grettir the Strong from the uh, saga of Grettir the Strong and um, his luck deserts him after a Draugr, uh, Revenant, places a curse on him but also after uh, the mother of his enemy tends to work the Seder magic and causes Grettir by the end of the saga to completely lose his uh, luck and end up dead at the hands of his enemies. So we have this idea of Seyth Kona performing magic to remove luck, but we also have a concept known as Draum Konur, like literally the dream women. These are very strange spirit women who appear as harbingers of ill fortune and advice, and they are part of the larger community of the inhabitants of dreams that can be somewhat compared to soul tra traveling agents of magic of Seyther and this can also be brought together with the uh, personification of, um, of luck reinforcing this uh, idea of the soul itself being composed of multiple uh, parts. There is also the question of whether luck had something to do with the moral qualities of Norse heroes and uh, kings. Um, Yes and no, rather not. There is there is some overlapping with the concept of Nithinger, meaning a wretched creature, a scoundrel, uh, in the idea that such a person is devoid of luck. However, we do have a lot of counterexamples of luckless yet excellent warriors. To name just a few, Nioska uh, Saga, Skarpedin, Hokan Jarl in um, Olaf Saga, Trikva Sonar, Gisli Sursson, Gretir Osmundar Sonar, and many more. An example stating this relationship, however, we find in Vatsdöla saga, but like I said, there are also a lot of counterexamples. Thatse ek at tu ert in versti o habna mother, ok foro brotu in vanda manfila ok homher aldri. So this means I see you are the worst luckless man, be gone you wretched scum and never come back. You can find this statement, so this relationship between um, a person being extremely unlucky and in the same time being extremely undesired in society. Nevertheless, there was this general expectation, if you were a hero and especially if you were a king, that you had a decent amount of luck, that you also functioned as a luck bringer for the whole 
kingdom. And this is expressed beautifully by a quote in Lakstula Saga, Mun konungur vera giptu drukur o kamingyumiki. Heavy in luck would be the translation. So a man of luck, here you can also find multiple terms designating this giptu mother, heila mother, gevu mother, hamingyu mother. So these, all these terms refer to this idea that the king must have possessed a high amount of luck in order to ensure the prosperity of his kingdom. And you can find this idea um, pretty clearly stated in two examples from the Inglinga saga again, in the example of Domaldi and in the example of Hagthan the Black. So Domaldi is an ill fortunate king. Peace and good seasons, which imply good harvests, so uh, food for the whole community, as a result of mild weather, are the most prevalent markers of the good king. So a good harvest didn't have to do with the climate or the weather. It had to do with the quality of the king. And um, this is based on a, a special relationship created in this literary work, in the Inglinga saga, between the god Ingvi Freuer, the god of fertility, and the Inglingar as his descendants. So the kings should have acted like Freuer, like bring prosperity. And Domaldi is a king who, uh, who failed because there was a famine during his reign. And the people believe that his failure as a rightful true king was the cause of this famine. The reason for Domaldi's lack of favor was given earlier. His stepmother had worked witchcraft on him to bring him osgesa, which is a term for ill luck, most probably. So he was the one responsible for these things which now are yeah, explainable in um, other manners. They don't have to do with the, the character of a man. Uh, but yeah, the king's luck was extraordinarily powerful in that it was something that could be shared with the whole community. It could be distributed to his people in a form uh, in which everyone would have benefited from it. And the other example is from the saga Hartan Asvarta, the saga of Hartan the Black. It's exactly the opposite. Hartan is presented from the very beginning as someone who could achieve greatness for his people. Uh, he wins territories, for example, and he was very fortunate in having prosperity through good seasons. So luck is connected to the king and also in a very palpable way, it is connected to his body as well. Um, and its ability to be transferred to uh, to others. There is a strong link to place here, to a particular place benefiting from the fragmentation of his, um, uh, his body. That's what happens to his um, corpse, actually. It's it is fragmented and uh, each uh, part is uh, sent to a particular uh, place. And you can link that you can link this as well to the um, ability of God Freuer uh, to bless the uh, land. Let's uh, look at a text here. So what the people did with Halfdan's corpse. So mikit gerdu men ser um han, at tho er that spurdisk, at han var dauder, og lik hans var flut, og ringa riki, og var þar til grabtar etlat, so foru rikismen af rauma riki og af vestfólu og heiðmorg og beirusk allir að hafa líkið með sér og hauga í sínu fylgi og þótti það vera orvend þeir er neði. En þeir settusk svo að líkinu var skipt í fjórastadi og var hófuðið lagið í haug að steini og hringa riki en hverir flutu heim sín hluta og heigdu og eru það allt kaladir. Holtanas Haugar. This is from chapter 9. Men held him in such high regard that when it was heard that he had died and his body was transported to Hringariki with burial planned, the noblemen from Raumariki, Westfold, Heidmark, and others came forth and requested to have his body with them to bury in their districts. They considered it an honor those who could attain it. However, they reached a settlement that the body would be divided into four parts. The head was placed in a mound at Staini in Hringariki, while each group carried their share home to bury. These are all known as Holftan's mounds. So you can see this 
particular special link between uh, the place and a part of the body of the king as a symbol for his great fortune that should be also transferred uh, further. Now, he's not the only example. If you look throughout the sagas, you're going to find other examples. For example, Harald Fairhair is said to have had great luck in uh, hunting, which was a sign that the gods favoured him. Olaf Tryggvason had several battles and was lucky as a leader of, of troops. Harald Hardrodam expanded Norway's colonial possessions in the Orkney, Shetland and Hebrides islands and that is why he is also regarded as having the favour of the gods. And a counterexample, Eric Bloodaxe, he is described as being very unlucky, his lucklessness being induced by a ritual performed by uh, the poet and warrior Egil Skatlagrimson. So what can we conclude? There probably was this idea of Germanic sacral kingship beyond the literary sources, or at least we do have traces of it, pretty prevalent traces in multiple sagas, the belief in the dependence of prosperity on the king's right relationship with the divine. This is not only Germanic, I think uh, it is present in uh, multiple cultures. And um, we do have a quote from Beowulf, for example, highlighting precisely this uh, idea. Wethet Ellenwerch estumitium feochtan fremedon. We performed bold work in fight with great favor. So if you're a king or a hero, but especially a king, you would have had the favor of the gods, but this needed to be made manifest. So the people should have been able to see that and how they could have seen it. Well, one of the best ways was when they led a good and prosperous um, life, which is why we have the concept of or ok frid. Or the year didn't only mean a year, but it meant a prosperous year. So. The moment you had a good harvest, that meant that you were legitimate and rightful as a king. And I'm going to end this presentation with another quote from uh, the saga of Olaf Tryggvason from chapter 50. It is true to say about Jarl Håkon that he had many of the qualities requisite for a ruler. First of all, a fine pedigree, along with that wisdom and cleverness in managing his rule, boldness in battle, and in addition, the good fortune to be able to win victory and kill his enemies. So you can see here multiple elements that would have made a good king. First, the descendants, family uh, then you needed to be a good warrior and then you needed to have the favor of the gods you needed to show that you were indeed lucky in conclusion at least according to the literary sources the king had a special relationship um, with the community in that his virtues and luck could be transferred to the whole community and this highlights his role as a mediator between the higher powers, the gods and a community pretty much dependent upon him to provide protection and balance and meaning. This was a presentation I held with the University of Western Australia online in October last year, uh, but so far I didn't really have the opportunity to uh, record it. It wasn't uh, recorded uh, initially. If you are further interested in the topic, you can find um, a selective bibliography here at the end, so feel free to, uh, to check that out. Otherwise, thank you for, so much for listening and I hope this was uh, interesting and informative to you. If you want more content, just uh, hit me with the subscribe button. May the gods favor you with a fair amount of luck. Until next time.